So it's been really uh, quite an interesting transition going from the State Department to Bechtel, as you can imagine, and it's a big, uh, a big adjustment. But it has been very interesting to see the way that um, government um, looks at the international competition. And I think the most important thing, uh, you know, it's what, uh, what Acting Secretary Shanahan said on, um, on his first day on the job is China, China, China. Uh, in the engineering, construction, and infrastructure business, uh, Bechtel faces very, very intense competition from China in all of our international markets. Um, if you, uh, I would, I, probably there are not many subscribers in this room to Engineering Digest, but um, <laughs> it, they have this very interesting um, survey that they do every year, and they list the top uh, 250 uh, engineering and construction firms in the world. And in 2008, there were no Chinese firms in the top wow. 10. Wow. And today, and th I, just, I just checked this the other day, in 2018, there are eight Chinese firms in the, the top 10. And Bechtel, which had always been in the top 10, has now been displaced to number 12. So this is the level of competition that we are seeing. And of course, all of these Chinese firms are state firms or parastatal firms. They have tremendous support from their government. Um, there's almost no limit to the level of uh, financing that they have access to. And that's not the case for U.S. firms. So uh, during the time, I mean, really for the last two years, uh, Exim Bank has been moribund. So every OECD country in the world, except the United States, has export finance apparatus. Um, the United States does not have that. So Bechtel has been forced to resort to export financing from other countries. So uh, we, we're working now on a motorway in Kenya, and we're going to go to the UK Export Finance Agency to finance that. And you know what that means. That means that we are going to source the materials, services, uh, and other things that we can out of the United Kingdom, not the United States. So that's business that the United States is losing right there. Again, Exim Bank is absolutely essential to restoring American competitiveness internationally. Again, we're the only OECD country without an active export finance uh, capability. Um, we could talk about the BUILD Act. I think the BUILD Act is well-intentioned. It's nice to see a bipartisan legislation. But really, the BUILD Act is a very modest measure. Uh, they're talking about $60 billion. That's how much the Chinese have already dedicated to Africa. Africa alone. Um, you look at the BUILD Act, they're capped at $500 million I investments. You know, the Chinese are not capped at $500 million. They're not capped at a billion. They're not capped at two billion. So if we're going to compete in this region, and, and, you know, and I'm obviously focused on the infrastructure, but this is going, I mean, we're all seeing the headlines about Huawei. And I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, so apologies. Uh, but, you know, this is going on in areas where the United States has traditionally led, like in telecommunications yeah. and yeah. communications apparatuses yeah. and things like this. So um, I think you know, what we need to do is take the momentum of the BUILD Act and expand it by about 100 times. U.S. business represents a powerful component of U.S. soft power. You know that when American businesses come into a competition, they're not going to be cheating. They can't possibly cheat. You know, um, because of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So, you know, I used to always, I had this line in Iraq, they didn't really like it, I said, you know, you know, trout, you know, you know, you see trout in a stream, you know it's a clean stream. You see American businesses uh, in a tender, you know it's going to be a clean tender. And if American business wins, you know it was a clean process. And, and the opposite is also true. Uh, so, um, that's part of our American soft power, that's part of our uh, total value package as a U.S. Uh, in, in terms of the U.S. bilateral partnership. And I have long wondered, you know, we have, uh, you know, long had Iran Middle East watchers in, you know, key European capitals. I have no idea why we don't have China watchers in a lot of these places. I think the best advice I think we already got from Ambassador Byerly, which is to have a commercial strategy. And I think one of the things, the, you know, the planning sort of calendar in the embassy uh, should always incorporate, how, you know, what are our commercial objectives? How are we going to help these U.S. firms? And, you know, um, and how are we, you know, who's going to do it and who's going to do what when? And, and uh, I think, you know, having a very nice integrated strategy like Ambassador Barley 
uh, outlined is, is really very useful. And it's going to be different in every, embri every embassy, obviously, because not every embassy has a commercial section and other things. But I think setting goals is really important. Uh, two, um, I think, um, again, I mean, one of the, the re as, a, as ambassador, um, the reason I wanted to be a resource for U.S. Um, companies, and I also wanted to be a resource for uh, foreign companies who want to do business in the, in the United States is because, of course, the, the primary objective is to help uh, improve people's lives in the United States, right? As U.S. diplomats, that's our primary objective. We're supposed to be helping Americans and helping improve their lives. So if we can help sell U.S. goods or services in the country we're serving in, we're improving people's lives. That's the primary objective as far as I'm concerned. Um, but trade, you know, lifts all boats. And uh, you can't have, you know, if you create trade one way, you're going to be able to create trade both ways. And I had the advantage of serving at the embassy in Amman, and we had a free trade agreement. So it was, as a matter of policy, we were, we were promoting not only U.S. goods and services, but also helping Jordanians promote goods and services back. And that, again, was improving lives in Jordan, and that was a positive thing. But what I really recognized was that being involved in this was a tremendous public diplomacy um, benefit. That, you know, you, we had this great uh, Facebook page that they, I didn't know anything about uh, social media, of course, but I was educated by the young staff. We had this Facebook page, and then we said, if we're going to do it, we've got to do it big. And we had a million followers. And, you know, we would put uh, something that we were doing on the commercial side on the Facebook page, and you saw the hits that we would get. You saw the positive response. People like it. People knew that this was creating prosperity in Jordan and in other places. And so I think that in addition to the practical commercial benefits, you're getting a genuine public diplomacy benefit. And that's what I was talking about earlier is the soft power of the United States. You know, maybe in, my, in the part of the world where I served, People uh, are tired of the United States talking about democracy and, you know, human rights. And those are important messages. But, you know, frankly, um, you know, the, we have to think about how to present those messages to that audience. But they're not tired of hearing about U.S. technology, U.S. innovation, U.S. investment, U.S. job creation, uh, the U.S. style of doing business, which I referred to earlier. But you know, when you get a U.S. company coming into your country, you know it's going to create in-country value. We don't, we're not like the Chinese. We don't bring all of our workforce into that country. You know, Greg Delaware was a tremendous ally for Bechtel in the motorways that we've built in Kosovo. And he knows that 70 percent of the amount of money that Kosovo spent on that motorway stayed in Kosovo. And that's a, a really good public diplomacy message, you know, and to the extent that we can foster that, that's going to improve our, our relations around the world. I love that. I am such a believer that a big part of where our soft power comes from is the admiration that the host country has for what they see in American companies, whether it's the Marriott Corporation hiring people on merit, training them and promoting them, regardless of their last name and family connections, watching companies like Bechtel and CH2M Hill just solve complex problems and manage complex projects in a way that people go, gosh, only the Americans could do that. Thank you for that, Stu. I absolutely loved it. I have to say that most of the positive change that I saw in Russia and in the countries of Eastern Europe resulted from the influence and the demonstration effect of American companies. Uh, and those things have lasted. The culture, corporate culture, standards, practices, uh, Russia, soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, had a lot of companies that wanted to do uh, charitable things. So they ended up uh, sponsoring tennis matches, mostly. Uh, American companies came in and said, no, 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 here's how you do it. Where are your factories? What do you know about the communities? Uh, and a lot of this just sank in very, very quickly. Uh, it was remarkable to see this. And what's happened now, it's kind of interesting to see, as the pendulum now has swung back, unfortunately, and the forces that don't favor transparency, don't favor openness, don't really want to care about the local communities, uh, they're now fighting against Russians who understand the way the world works and, more importantly, understand how businesses help their bottom lines. And 
there's a kind of internal debate now that goes on in places like Russia, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, uh, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And I'm just very proud of the, the role that American businesses continue to play in influencing that debate. We'll never be on the inside of that debate, but we have a huge stake in how it comes out. Who wins the internal argument in a place like Russia? Uh, and the fact that American businesses, despite all the problems that we have uh, with Russia now, are still in the game, are still welcomed in Russia, and can mm -hmm. still have in influence and impact is something that I think we don't uh, value enough. Uh, things like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Stu was talking about FCPA. Uh, when I first saw that come into Russia, it was amazing to see how Russian businessmen could use that as a shield. Uh, if they were hit up for bribes, they could say, sorry, FCPA, I can't do this anymore, or else mm -hmm. these five consequences will ensue. <laughs> but then something even more interesting happened. Uh, by the time I left Russia in uh, 2012, I saw Russian businessmen using FCPA as not just as a shield, but as a sword. They would pick out competitors who were playing uh, a fast and loose game in contravention of FCPA rules, and they would use that as a, as a spear to go after these people. Uh, it was remarkable to see, even in a country like Russia in which corruption is endemic, it's the rule, not the exception, uh, how much standards, practices, and international law can actually win the, the argument at the end of the day.